was a time um, about 23 years ago when my daughter was bitten in the face by a dog and um, there was blood everywhere and she ended up having to have about 30 stitches in her face. And, and then there was a time when I was diagnosed with a life-threatening illness and then there was a time when Philip was and then there was a time when I was betrayed by a very close friend. And then there was a time a number of years ago when I felt so guilty about a choice I'd made in college. And then there was a time when I just had more bills than money. Anybody know that feeling? And then there was a time when I was confused about my future. You know, maybe you've been there. And then there have been times when I've traveled to great places and met awesome people. And then there was a time when I wrote my first book, which was from 10 at night until 2 in the morning for about five weeks. And I had young kids, and that's the only time I could actually do it. And I remember that. And then there was a time when I was just feeling overwhelmed with what God had entrusted me with. And in each of these situations, from the most painful to the annoying to the good, initially, my only response was and is to cry out to God, to talk to my Heavenly Father, to pray. We're finishing a series on prayer today, push, pray until something happens. And today in church, we are going to memorize an entire Bible verse. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. First Thessalonians 5.17, they're going to put it on the screens to help you. <laughs> Pray continually. All right, I'm going to count to three, and we're all going to say it together. One, two, three. Pray okay, we're going to do it again. One, two, three. Pray, Pray continually. continually. And now take it off the screens, and we're going to try it from memory. Dig deep. Ready? One, two, three. Pray. You guys are such professionals. It's amazing. <laughs> so the question is, how do you actually do that? How do you do that? I mean, did the Apostle Paul who wrote that, did he actually mean that? Or is that just one of those things that sounds super spiritual? Well, it's actually connected to a deep spiritual truth, the doctrine of God's omnipresence. And that means that he is everywhere. He is right here, right now. And everything hinges on this. We really can do life with peace and joy and security and wisdom and guidance, or we can do life without God. See, God doesn't inflict himself on anyone. And without him, life can mean insecurity and anxiety and isolation and temptation and fear. See, God's desire is to be in relationship and to have communion with us, and he communicates it over and over and over in the Bible. In Genesis, we read a story about a man named Jacob, and he is early on in the story of God's people. So God had revealed himself to Abraham and Isaac, and then there's Jacob. And Jacob is not a nice guy in a lot of ways. And he deceives his father and he betrays his brother in order to get the family birthright. And now his brother wants to kill him, so he has to leave home. And this raises a big question. Will God go with him? He would pass through many areas where people did not know the God of, the, of his fathers. And in the ancient world, the notion among the heathens was that if you left your home, you left your God. So Jacob was young, and he was perhaps not so familiar with the God of his fathers. And it tells us in Genesis 28.10, it says, Jacob left Beersheba, his home, and set out for Haran. So he left his home, and he set out for Haran. And that was not just an easy journey. It was 600 miles. He was going to some place that was not his home, and that raised the question, will God go with him? Will God be there? John Ortberg, who's a great teacher, he said it really is a story of grace because Jacob hadn't earned God's presence. And so no one in the world at this time is thinking about this universal, all-present God. And here's actually what happens in Genesis 28. It says, Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. And when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And there above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. And I am with you, verse 15, and I will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. That is the first time that occurs in the Bible. 
I am with you. There's this old song from back in the day in church, especially in Sunday school, called Climbing Jacob's Ladder. Any old school Sunday school people? We are climbing Jacob's Ladder. We are climbing Jacob's Ladder. For the rest of you, you're not old. Anyway, um, but the interesting, so that's an old song, right? We are climbing Jacob's Ladder. But do you notice in the story what Jacob is not doing? Yeah, he's not climbing a ladder. The song got it wrong. Because this is not a ladder that Jacob uses to get from here to up there. This is a ladder where up there actually comes down here. And Jacob sees angels ascending and descending. And so then there's this vision of this amazing God who said, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and I will go with you. He is a God with a ladder. The idea is that we don't have to go to a special place to communicate with God, but God is with us in the ordinary places of our lives. And in Genesis 28, continuing, it says, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. And he was afraid, and he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gateway to heaven, the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he'd placed under his head, and he set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel. So Jacob names this place Bethel, which means house of God. El is from the Hebrew and means God. And hundreds of years later, humanity, people, were so far from God that he sent his son so that his presence would always be with each one of us. One of the names of Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. He is with you. Are you following him or expecting him to follow you? He's with us. Now I want you to do right now, I just want you to pull out the stone that you were given when you walked in the door. The church today, you were, everybody was given a little stone. If you weren't, just put your hands up because this is going to be an important little thing. Keep your hands up. If you didn't get one, our ushers will be no throwing the rocks. Just pass them down the aisle. <laughs> and up there in the balcony, if you need one, just put your hands up. We'll get one to you. Now keep your hand up and listen at the same time, Okay. So this is going to be a little reminder, a little icon, if you will, for what we are all going to do tomorrow. This little stone is going to represent Bethel. So Jacob, he took a stone and he made it into a memorial presence of God. So we're going to take the stone with us as a reminder that our God is with us. See, he's always been about being a part of our everyday life. So how can we make tomorrow, which is an ordinary day, a day that we spend with God? See, being with God doesn't mean that you do things you don't ordinarily do. Mostly it just means doing the things you ordinarily do, but doing them with God. So let's see how we can take an ordinary day and make it Bethel, gateway to heaven, up there, coming down here into our lives. So I'm going to use some props that will help us as we walk this out. Of course I am, because if you've heard me teach, I do props. All right, so this is how we are actually going to be able to pray continually. Remember what that verse says? One, two, three? Pray. Right. Okay. Here is a pillow. So tonight, tonight when you go to bed, you're going to probably use a pillow. Interesting thing about this, when we think about days, we think of them beginning in the morning and, you know, with the sunrise. But to the ancient Hebrew, the day begins at night. Genesis 1:19 it says, and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. It begins with the evening. Now, why does it start with the evening? Well, maybe because it's a reminder that while you sleep, God is running the world. He is still God. God doesn't sleep, and he can still be God while we're sleeping. So turn to the person next to you and say, sleep good tonight. God can run the world without you. <laughs> the idea is that tonight, and remember your day starts with tonight, that you say right when you put your little head on the pillow, you say thank you. Thank you that I am alive this day, and then you just let go. Let go, let go of the worries. You actually weren't designed to carry the burdens and the worries. And some see sometimes when we're still, that's actually when the worries start to crowd us, right? But just for tonight, let them go. 
Proverbs 3 says this, when you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Why? Verse 26, because the Lord will be at your side. Philippians 4, 6 says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Be anxious for. That's when you, 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 so he's saying when you're laying down, you just say, I just can't sleep. Because that's what happens when this state of mind takes over, this anxiety takes over. In the Greek text, all of these English words are a single word, merameo, and this word describes a condition when the concerns about life press on us so hard that we are unable to sleep. It's counterproductive and self-centered worry. Now, in the Greek world, the temporary escape from this kind of worry was, you know, getting drunk and having sex with whomever. And my observation tells me that the world hasn't really changed that much. Because the cares of the world sometimes drive us to do things that we know ultimately aren't good. Unless Christ literally changes your mind. I mean, did you notice the beginning of that verse? It says, do not be anxious about anything. It's an imperative. It's a commandment. It's not optional. He's saying, do this. So does this mean that God's going to fix everything? No. The commandment isn't about fixing things. It's about freeing your mind. The difference between a Christian and a world-bound person is this. A Christian just actually releases the cares of life to God and is free from anxiety while other people might be giving in to the cares and are just bound by fear. See, this commandment is about the freedom that comes when we realize that life is not within our control, but it is within God's. And if God's in control, then what are we worried about? He cares for us. So we're all going to go to bed tonight, and tonight... Tonight, we're just taking this one day at a time, remember? But tonight, just put the little stone by your bed, reminding you of Bethel, God with you, and go to sleep in Jesus' name. Let go. So this is all about praying continually. And then the next thing that'll happen is that you'll wake up in the morning, and um, some of you, that's the highlight of your day, and others, yeah, not so much. There are two kinds of people in the world, those who can't wait to wake up and those who hate those who love to get up. Um, So maybe you have an alarm clock that looks like this, probably not. It's, you know, probably your phone. But regardless, whatever it is that wakes you up, let's don't call it an alarm clock. Let's call it a rise and shine (laughs) clock. You hate me right now, don't you? Um, You know, the embrace the day clock, let's call it that. But here we are with our little stone right next to our rise and shine clock. And let's wake up with these words. Psalm 118, 24 says, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. You know, I'm not talking about the next day when all my circumstances change or work out, but today, this day, this ordinary day, which is not ordinary because you are with me, God, because of Emmanuel. Now, we have to fight for that because oftentimes, regret over the past And fear of the future will attempt to get in. And so in this moment, ask Jesus to go with you throughout the day. Just before your feet hit the floor, say, Jesus, be with me today. I'm trusting you with this day. That's it. Again, it's about praying continually. And then maybe, you know, after your feet hit the floor, you, you know, head to the bathroom to brush your teeth. Please brush your teeth because things grow in your mouth in the nighttime. That's disgusting, right? (laughs) So... As you are cleaning your teeth or washing your face, take the little stone with you, right? It's a reminder. And so as you clean up, take the stone to the sink or the shower or wherever, and this would be a good time maybe to ask God to clean your heart, clean your soul. Psalm 139 says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You know, just... Start the day being cleansed by God can be such a freeing thing because we've done, we've all made mistakes, but let's start this day. Cleanse me, God. Free me. Cleanse me, God, because I know my mouth can spout off words it shouldn't. Do I have any friends in here? Right? My mouth can dwell on thoughts that are not great. So asking God to cleanse my mouth and my heart. I mean, we got to clean up anyway, but just for tomorrow... Do it in Jesus' name. Then um, we probably all have a phone. And just for my illustration here, my phone has confetti in it. Of course it does. Um, But just for tomorrow, let's let the phone stand for relationships, 
you're gonna see people. Just ask God to help you see them the way he sees them. Oh, and that can be so hard because people are weird, right? People are weird. <laughs> so maybe tomorrow, let's just see our appointments and our phone calls as, as maybe this person, God is sending them to me to teach me something. Maybe this is from God. I mean, you gotta answer the phone and you have to see people, but just for tomorrow, let's do it in Jesus' name. All right, and then most of us are going to get into a car and drive, right? What would it look like if we were to drive in Jesus' name? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. In Jesus' take. <laughs> Take the wheel. If Jesus was in the car with us, what would the expression on his face look like? Wow! <laughs> How would we treat other drivers? All right, it might sound funny, but when Paul said to pray continuously, he was talking about things like this, the ordinary moments in our lives. Last year, over 40,000 people died in auto accidents. Usually, because people were in a hurry, they're distracted or they're mad, so maybe driving in Jesus' name simply means that I leave early enough so I'm not in a hurry or I don't text or I actually will drive as if God is with me. I mean, what would that look like? Maybe sometimes it means as you're driving tomorrow, you're just quiet. Instead of turning on the radio and, and uh, listening to anything else, maybe you're just quiet in the car listening for what God might be saying to you. Or maybe there's moments tomorrow as you put this little stone in your car because God is with you, maybe you're just praying. You're praying for the needs of other people. You're just taking a moment to pray. You know, the way God's kingdom is established in the earth is by prayer. Matthew 6.10 says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer. So maybe tomorrow when you drive, the little stone is with you, Pray. Drive as if Jesus is there. Boy, we could be different drivers tomorrow. And then at some point, you'll go to work. I mean, whether here's a computer, maybe you'll work at home or you'll work at an office, but most of us work somewhere. So how about tomorrow you just work with God? Colossians 3 says this, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. So if Jesus was your supervisor, how would you work? Remember works, this is going with you, right there on your desk. Well, I would show up on time and I would have the best attitude. I would seek to be diligent and creative and when I got stuck and didn't know what to do, I would ask him. So put that stone on your desk so that when you're dealing with a tough situation or a really annoying coworker, it'll remind you. Work becomes something that I talk about with God. And I do it with all my heart. And then at some point tomorrow, you're gonna have a meal. You know, a plate filled with food. And maybe you'll take that moment to just thank God for providing for you. And maybe that's the moment as the stone is with you next to your plate that you can actually ask God for provision for whatever you might need. So this is the moments in our day tomorrow where we're gonna take this stone and remind ourselves that God is with us in the everyday, ordinary moments of our life. And remember, he's leading, we're following. He's leading, we're following. But he's with us in every moment. And now, I just want to paint a picture about this God who is with you always. Because you could do this. You could take the stone with you and not change your life. But let me tell you about the God who is. John Ortberg continues by saying, every person of deep prayer has been marked by this conviction about God. And every person who doesn't share this specific conviction will consistently find prayer to be an uphill struggle. Our world, the culture we live in, tends to erode this conviction in us. People who know God really well are gripped by it. It's what gives them a sense of faith and well-being. The Apostle Paul had this conviction. And it can be expressed in a fabulous prayer that Paul wrote in his letter to the Ephesians. So receive these words right now from Ephesians as Paul's prayer for you. Ephesians 3.14, for this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you, put your name there, 
with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you, put your name there, may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Okay. So here's the conviction that we all need to have. Here is the conviction. Now to him who is able. God is able able. That is the conviction we need. Our God is able. Your God is able. Able to do what? Whatever needs to be done in this world and in your life. No problem can stop him. No circumstance can worry him. No outcome confuses him. I know the circumstances that sometimes we find ourselves in that there are prayers that haven't gotten answered the way we want them to and that can make us doubt this or question this. But then I remember that Paul wrote this while he was in prison, in chains, suffering, persecuted by Rome, waiting to die. That was his circumstance. But you know what he did not write? He did not write this. For this reason I kneel before the Father. I pray that out of his glorious riches you would get me out of prison. He didn't pray that. See, it was this conviction that Paul had that God is able, the same conviction whether he was in jail or in a palace. My God is able, no matter what I'm facing. What do I need to know about God if I'm gonna pray to him? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more. It's like Paul is saying, I know, I know the world that we live in is gonna cause us to underestimate God, to cause you to think too little of him, so I wanna make it clear, our God is able but not just able to do, he's not a cosmic bystander, he is active in the universe. He is able to do what we ask. That's what James 4.2 says, you don't have because you don't ask. There was a survey done on prayer by Newsweek a number of years ago and they published the result of this survey and they found out that 87% of the people surveyed believe that God answers prayers. 87% of the people surveyed believe God answers prayers. 54% say they pray. Right, the main challenge in prayer is not a theology of prayer, it's that we don't pray. The big secret to answer prayer is to pray, (laughs) to connect with God. And then Paul takes it even further. He says he's able to do not just what we ask, but what we imagine. What we imagine. And then he's bigger than that. He's able to do more than we imagine. And not just a little bit more, but exceedingly, abundantly more. In fact, that is a made-up word. There is no word that was in the Greek language that Paul was writing. He made up a word to mean super abundantly. It's like super califragilistically, amazingly, abundantly. Big word. God is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. There is nothing that is logically possible or consistent with God's character that God can't do. But here's the deal. We won't pray if we don't have that conviction, if we don't believe that God is able. Our God is able. Able to do what? Well, he's able to interact with the laws of nature and suspend them because he's actually the one who created them. He can part a body of water so that others can cross through on dry land. He can calm a storm simply by saying, peace be still. He is Lord over time so that when the children of Israel needed an extended day to win a battle, God actually stopped the sun. Our God is able to make a day last as long as he wants. Anybody in here need extra time in your day? (laughs) He's able to make the walls of Jericho come down. He was able to take a, a little boy named David and defeat a giant named Goliath. He was able to make a drought and a flood and a rainbow as a reminder of his promise. There's a great story in the Bible about God's power over natural causes, and it concerns a man named Naaman. Now, Naaman wasn't even an Israelite. He was an Aramean. He was a powerful man, and and he was a commander of his forces. Well, one day, Naaman found a spot on his skin, and in a way that can sometimes happen, he realizes that he's simply been living in the illusion 
of control and he can't do anything about his leprosy. And he ends up as most desperate people too, turning to God. And so he goes to Israel because he's heard about this God of miracles. And he goes to Israel and he finds the prophet Elisha and he begs him for help. Well, Elisha doesn't even come out of the house. He just sends a messenger to tell Naaman, go dip yourself seven times in the river Jordan and God will heal him. We pick up the story in 2 Kings 5. It says, but Naaman, after he heard this, went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out of and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of leprosy. We always think we know better. We have this plan in which we want God to move. God will always be God. And in verse 9 says, Are not Abana and Farfar the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Because the Jordan was not a clean river. So he's like, couldn't I have even washed in a clean one? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. But Naaman's servants went to him and said, uh, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? See, if the prophet had said do, some, and do something in a way that you wouldn't have had to humble yourself, wouldn't you have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed. So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Our God is able, able to heal a grouchy leper. And God's power is not limited to the laws of nature. This is reality. Our God is able. Our God is able to bring deliverance from impossible situations. Some of you are facing one right now. Well, he is able to deliver. He delivered Daniel from a lion's den. He was able to deliver three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from a fiery furnace. He was able to deliver Joseph from Pharaoh's prison. He was able to deliver Israel from Egyptian slavery, Queen Esther from genocide, Elijah from Queen Jezebel. Anybody in here need deliverance from a hard situation? Our God is able. He is able. And not only that, he's able to provide. He's able to provide manna for 40 years. He's able to bring water out of a rock. He's able to order birds, ravens to feed Elijah when he couldn't do it himself. He was able to take two fish and some loaves and feed 5,000 plus people and have leftovers. And not only that, our God is able. He is able to change the hearts of men and women. He's able. He's able to soften the hard heart of Pharaoh so that Pharaoh let the people go. He was able to strengthen the frightened heart of a man named Gideon so that he could ultimately lead the people. And he was able to take a genocidal zealot named Saul and turn him into a self-sacrificing missionary named Paul who wrote more than half of the New Testament and whose theology we all claim today. He is able, he is able. That is our God, that is our God. But not only that, not, none of his power has diminished. Hebrews 13 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His power has not diminished. He's able to take a woman who has been addicted to drugs for decades and set her free. I have seen that happen. He's able to take a marriage that's full of bitterness and hopelessness and put it back together. I've seen it happen. He's able to take a man who's been disgraced by sin and make him into a new creature. I have seen it happen. He's able to come alongside a family who is devastated by loss and offer hope, reassuring them that death does not get the last word. He's able to replace fear with faith in a human heart. He did it in mine. He is able to heal brokenness. He is able to reconcile relationships. He's able to heal. He's able to provide meaning. He's able to give hope. He's able to raise Jesus from the dead. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine or think. You know, most of us, we probably believe that there's a God who would do mighty things. But the next step is to believe that he's able to do them for me. See, maybe we think my faith is too weak or whatever. But here's the truth. Our God is able. Our God is big enough to run the universe and small enough to dwell in your heart. Our God is big enough to run the universe and small enough to dwell in your heart. He is able. He is able. So what are we going to do? We're going to pray. 
When you see that stone next to your pillow, or your clock, or your car, or on your desk, you're praying to the God who is there and who is able. When you go to sleep, the God who is able can take all of your worries. When you're awake, the God who is able can help you rejoice in this day. When you drive, the God who is able can help you. When you work, the God who is able can do more than you ask or imagine or think. A while ago, I was in a situation that involved real disappointment. And um, there was an outcome that was desperately important, but it was out of my control. And I heard someone whose integrity and wisdom I trust, I heard them say, this will be a test of your joyful confidence in God. And I live with those words every day. This will be a test of your joyful confidence in God. And everybody has a test. So where is your joyful confidence in God being tested? See, and the invitation is, every day, every day, will you commit to praying about whatever is concerning you? Take this stone with you in your ordinary life tomorrow. Whatever you're carrying, our God is able. Whatever you brought in here, our God is able. Whatever is the deepest longing in your heart, I don't know how, I don't know when, but I know that our God is able. What is the one thing that you're believing that God is able to do for you? What is that? Well, pray. Put that on a connect card and we'll join you in prayer. Our God is able. And how awesome for Oasis to truly become a house of prayer. But it doesn't become a house of prayer because we put a big banner outside that says house of prayer. It becomes a house of prayer because it's filled with people who actually pray. Who pray to God in their everyday, ordinary moments. It doesn't have to be the deep, always on your face prayer. You can have those. But it's just the everyday moments. Everyday moments. We make time for a lot of things. We make time for a lot of things. Let's make time for prayer. Our God is able. He is able. When you start to doubt what might be coming or happening, our God is able. He is able to deal with that situation. He's able to heal that place in your heart. He's able to heal relationships, restore marriages. He is able. That's who we're praying to, the God who is able. Now, if I could just get you to stand to your feet, we're going to take a moment right now, and we're going to worship the God who is able. The God who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine or think. And so right now as we worship, sometimes we're so tempted to worry as if that fixes anything. But right now in this moment, you can worry or worship, but you can't really do both. So let's just take a moment and let's worship the God who is able. Just release the care to him. Release it to him just in this moment. Everything's going to be happening when you get out there, but you just release it right now. And tonight when you get home and your day begins, remember it starts at night, you put this little stone by your pillow and you again release the cares and the worries. Let's be a people who believe and trust that God is able.